You are listening to Cabernet Murder, Book 1, in Vines, Feathers and Potion series, written by D.N. Leo. This audio edition is produced exclusively for the Multiverse Novels channel. Please support the channel by subscribing and liking the video, so that we can continue bringing D.N. Leo's multiverse stories to you. Chapter 7 Jasmine opened her eyes and enjoyed the warmth of the sunlight that brushed across her face. She lay still for a few seconds, enjoying the peacefulness. She listened to the sound of the birds chirping, and heard the faint sound of the pump starting up the irrigation system that watered the vineyards. Pump. Irrigation. She didn't normally hear that sound from her bed. She scrambled to her feet. She hadn't gone home last night. From the looks of things, she'd only had time to kick off her shoes before sleep claimed her. She glanced around and exhaled a sigh of relief. Bertram had driven back to the vineyards. She was exhausted and he was starving. Apparently, she'd passed out during a psychic episode before he had a chance to eat anything more than a single prawn in the salad. So instead of letting him walk her back to her place and then come back for his cold stale dinner, she'd grabbed the Chardonnay cabin and crashed for the night. Putting her shoes back on, she made a beeline from the Chardonnay block to a small road behind one of the cellars and headed home. Traveling that way, she wouldn't have to pass the front of the Merlot cabin. She was halfway home when she saw Bob sealing a broken pipe at the intersection of the Riesling and Sauvignon blocks. Bob Luca was the handyman she'd meant to call to fix the pothole in the driveway at the entrance to the vineyard. He looked up as he heard her footsteps. You were at the restaurant early today, Jasmine. His comment didn't come as a surprise, because she was coming from the direction of the restaurant, and she rarely went there until late morning. Good morning, Bob. Sorry I missed you on Friday. I wanted to ask you to fix the pothole at the entrance. He grinned. The nasty pothole in the driveway. I saw that. I'll patch it up before dark today. If I do it now, it will be driven on during the day, and the cement will never have a chance to dry. Thank you. And thanks for fixing the irrigation. Be sure to get Lisa to issue the payment before this Friday. I've already told her to give you the full amount in cash. Don't worry about giving us a discount. She waved her goodbye and continued on her way. No matter what people say I trust you, he said from behind her. And I know you're not that kind of people, Jasmine. She turned around. Excuse me? Bob stood and looked her in the eyes. He was in his late thirties, and had come to Gisborne a few months ago after being laid off from a construction company in the city. He had rented a small room in the next suburb over to look around the area for a job. If he hadn't found enough work, he would have moved back with his family in Geelong. But between the vineyards in Gisborne and the residential areas in the surrounding suburbs, sufficient work flowed in to keep him afloat, so he decided to stick around. With the murder in the B&B, people talk, you know. But I never believe them. I'm on your side, Jasmine. Just want to let you know. What are people saying? He shrugged. The B&B is your competition. Do people really think I'd kill a tourist to destroy the clientele of the competition and advance my business? Well, they didn't exactly say that. It may have been an accident or something. But, you know, it was your bottle of wine. Sorry, I meant it was a bottle of wine that was made by your vineyard. Bob obviously didn't know anything about wine. Bob, that bottle was a very expensive variety of wine, and a label that this vineyard stopped making long before I came here. Right. I'm sorry. I mean people talk. I just wanted to let you know that when you hear something and think I'm signed up with them, I'm not. Okay. But who are they? He rubbed the tip of his clunky work boot against a Riesling pole. If you keep doing that, Bob, that five-year-old pole is going to fall over. When you said people talk, who are those people? If you trust me, then tell me who told you about the bottle and made the allegation. He nodded, contemplated a bit, and then said, it was Barb. I didn't ask or anything. We share a house, you know that. She just said something when I bumped into her yesterday. Jasmine nodded. He was right in calling Barbara people. She was the hub of all the human gossip in town. If the locals bought Barbara's story, 
she would have the whole town taking this incident the wrong way. This sort of gossip would be picked up quickly by the paranormal community, and when it was, there would be trouble storming her way. The gossip didn't bother Jasmine. What bothered her was the kind of person Barbara was. She was the site manager for the B&B. She had come to town a couple of years ago and applied for a job at Vines and Soul Resort. Jasmine didn't think she was the right person for the job, so she gave the job to Lisa, which turned out to be one of the better decisions she had made throughout the years. Barbara was holding a grudge against her. Considering the recent murder and the fact that the B&B might shut down forever, thus putting Barbara on the job market again, it was unlikely that Barbara's sentiment toward Jasmine could be improved. I understand. Thanks for telling me, Bob. Most of the people in town are very sensible and won't listen to Barb. But thank you for believing me. Bob nodded and gestured toward a crooked pole at the end of the block. I'll straighten that one up and then come back just before dusk to fix the driveway. Thanks again. Come by the restaurant, I'll fix you some lunch. She smiled and waved at him again before scurrying home. She hadn't even reached her doorstep when her phone rang. As much as she hoped that it was either Beatrice or Mia who called, she knew that wasn't the case. She picked up and said, Samuel, how can I help? Because she knew exactly who it was and what he would say. Samuel Lopez held the highest ranking position in the coven. The Spanish born wizard hadn't come to Gisbon much before Jasmine. But the key was, even if he was only one day senior to her, he had arrived and had overseen the coven before she got there. He was the leader. In human terms, she was his deputy. Also in human terms, being a deputy was a role where one did all the work without getting any credit for it. Have you found out who killed the werewolf at the B&B? I've got coven leaders calling me from all over the place. This whole thing shines a bad light on our coven. Samuel, I know the characters on the murder mystery TV shows you watch can solve a murder case in 40 minutes, but in real life it takes days or even months to solve a case and there are cases that have never been solved. It's been barely 72 hours since the murder. I have the human police breathing down my neck and the human gossip community poking into my business and making stuff up about me. Why can't you for once just do your job and keep the paranormal community at bay for a few days to buy me some time? So you've got nothing for me? She rolled her eyes and decided not to waste her breath with an explanation. Nope. Okay, I think I've done you a favor with the body. Hang on. You stole the body? No, Jasmine. I sent someone to do it. Samuel, you need to discuss these actions with me beforehand. You told me you wanted me to handle the paranormal community. Yes, but not by hiding a body that had already been reported to the Central Human Police. And not by beating up the one and only medical examiner and paranormal sympathizer we have. What? I didn't do anything to hurt Landon. You didn't try to burn him last night? No. Why would I do that? Look, Jasmine, I don't know what's going on at your end. But I have the body. Let me know how you want me to handle it. The half-completed transformation looks really bad and I tried, but there's nothing I can do to hide it. So, if you want to show this to the human police, be prepared with some kind of explanation they'll buy. He hung up. Chapter 8 Jasmine looked through the glass doors and frowned at the buzzing restaurant before her. Maybe she was being paranoid, but Vines and Soul restaurant wasn't usually busy for breakfast. They catered to the guests in the cabins, and the resort wasn't at full capacity this week. Maybe the whole town had turned up to see how she was handling the murder investigation. Her cheeks burned when she stepped into the restaurant. People stared at her. She told herself it was just her imagination, but still, as soon as she saw Bertram sitting at a table by the window, she headed straight there without stopping at the counter to say hello to Lisa, her site manager. Bertram wore a dark-colored shirt, made of a soft material that flattered the definition in the upper body muscles she had seen by accident yesterday. Even though the shirt covered his bare skin, she couldn't get that image out of her mind. He was gorgeous. She was so distracted by the thought that she had to give herself a mental slap to bring herself back to the present. He stood and pulled out a chair for her. She sat and glanced quickly at his breakfast. 
She refrained from commenting on the two pieces of sourdough bread, the breakfast cereals, and the coffee Bertram had ordered. Cereal wasn't the best choice for him. He should have had a light bread, toasted with ham and cheese and tomato juice. The coffee was fine, but it should be consumed afterward and as a standalone, not mixed with the breakfast food. He had made his choices from what was on the menu, and there was no way he could have known that there were options that were better for him. She didn't know how she knew that. She just knew. No comments on food, she thought, and gave herself another mental slap. What's wrong with my breakfast cereal? Did I say anything was wrong? He smiled and his eyes twinkled. She noted the unusual color of his eyes, not quite black, not quite brown. And there was a colder shade there as well. Maybe deep blue. No, but your eyes said it. Next time, I'll wait for you to recommend something for me. She smiled at him. Did you sleep well? He nodded. Very well. What about you? I always sleep well. Lisa came over and set a plate with fruit on the table. The usual, she said with a smile. Jasmine knew Lisa had looked at the books and knew who Bertram was and which cabin he was in. She would have already introduced herself and made acquaintance. That was one of the reasons she had employed Lisa and not Barbara. No matter how much Barbara resented her for it, if Jasmine had to make the choice again, she would still choose Lisa. Could I have a coffee now, Lisa? Lisa frowned. You're not having breakfast? You only drink coffee by itself and after meals. I need coffee now. Please. Lisa sighed, nodded, and headed toward the coffee machine. Bertram spread butter and jam on his toast. Aside from five olives late afternoon and a couple of prawns in the salad before dinner, I bet you've not had much else to eat since yesterday. You think I'm counting calories? she asked. He smiled. It's a professional hazard. You're about five foot eleven. With all your clothes on plus the bag, I doubt you'd hit sixty kilograms. So no, I don't think you need to count calories. Commenting on a woman's weight is treading dangerous water. But I'd stick my neck out and say you need more than fruit and coffee for breakfast. If I need to take you to the hospital every half hour because you fainted, it would really affect my working schedule on this case. You're on a schedule? He smiled. No, not exactly, but my boss wants the case, if there is a case, solved ASAP. What do you mean by, if there is a case? He sipped his coffee and smiled at her. Oh, that's right, she said, you're not supposed to talk to me about the case. I might be one of your suspects. Understood. He smiled again, and she wished he wouldn't do that because it distracted her. The first part is accurate, but the second part is not. You are not one of my suspects. She nodded. All right, then that means you don't yet have a list of suspects and everyone who has even a remote motive might be a suspect. He looked at her, over the rim of his coffee cup. His eyes twinkled with intrigue, but he used the coffee as an excuse for not giving her immediate response. And for that, she thought, he deserved to have coffee mixed with a poor choice of breakfast cereal and orange juice. After you finish, I'll take you to the B&B. I've called their site manager. I have the keys to the premises because the owners of the B&B &B left them with me. The site manager will meet us there. Thank you, Jasmine. She's the one who discovered the body, right? That's what I was told. But you can ask her yourself. He nodded. Just one thing I think you should know, she continued. Barbara had previously applied for a job here, and I didn't hire her. Ah. So you're not on her list of those to be invited to her parties. He grinned. Jasmine sighed. I'd never want to go to her parties. But she has a small community she's close to. They kinda communicate with each other a lot. So, if you need to interview her friends and her network, you might want to take the information they give you with a grain of salt. Noted. Thank you. He locked eyes with her. Did you see the body? No. They called me, but I told them to call the hospital. Landon to be precise. Bertram frowned. I understand that you live right next door, but when there's a dead body involved, wouldn't calling the police be the first course of action? She shrugged. I have no control over their actions, Bertram. All I know is that they called me. And because I am currently without car, 
I told them to call Landon. I couldn't go there to check on them, so I called Beatrice and Mia. They arrived at the same time as Landon, so they saw the body. I might live next door, but considering the size of this property, by the time I walked there, the body might have begun to decompose. I decided to stay here, and let them come to me after they finished doing what they needed to do. And you are Carlos because? I drove into a ditch last week. My car is at the garage. Bertram finished the last drop of his coffee. Let's go to the B&B &B then. Then after that, I'd like to go to the morgue. I want to take a look at the body. And Dr. Zibble called me this morning. Landon is awake and can take an interview. Chapter 9 Mia turned into a small public car park where her office building had a spot reserved for her. Regardless of how small the town of Gisborne was, having a private car park right in front of the office on the main street wasn't an affordable option. She had cleared her schedule of human clients and didn't plan to work in the office today, but she needed some notes about a cold case, so she had come in. It would have been a lot more efficient if she had electronic files of her notes. But her ingrained habit of taking notes by hand was hard to let go. That was how she processed information. She loved the feel of paper, the smell of ink, and the sound of the pen tip brushing against the surface of the paper fiber when she wrote. Her senses were super sharp and she knew it. She might be the deadliner of a shapeshifter family and have no supernatural ability, but she knew her senses were special and she intended to hang on to them for as long as she could. She hesitated before inserting the key into the lock to open her office door. Next to Dr. Mia Lee's name tag on the door was a cartoon figure of a rabbit head. Its long ears pointed into the air, and it had two gigantic front teeth sticking out of its mouth that looked as if they could bite a lot more than carrots. She recognized the drawing and couldn't help but smile. She turned around. Lucian, she said even before she saw her cousin, whom she hadn't seen for over six years, leaning against the column to her left with his legs crossed at the ankles. He smiled at her. He had changed a lot in six years. His father had married a Norwegian woman from a famous Viking family. The mix of supernatural blood and human warrior blood had made Lucian as gorgeous as a warrior, right out of a comic book. But Mia knew her cousin better than anyone. He had bulked up a lot, and looked a lot like a warrior, but there was not a single fighting bone in his body. If her memory served her correctly, he was an oil painting artist. My beautiful Mia. He came over to her and gave her a bare hug, almost lifting her off the ground. How long have you been in town? About a week. I stayed in Melbourne, though. She rolled her eyes. Like forty minutes away. Why didn't you call me? Where's the fun and surprise in that? She opened her office door. Come on in. I'll grab what I need and then we can get out of here. I'll buy you lunch. He frowned. You're not working today? She smiled at him. That's the beauty of being your own boss. I cleared my schedule for the day. I need to help Jasmine with something. Consider yourself lucky. Jasmine, he said with a purring sound. Mia slapped his shoulder. Stop that. Remember your broken nose? Seriously, she's still going out with that guy. No, they broke up a year ago. But that doesn't mean you'd have a chance with her. Lucian smiled. My heart is broken. You're supposed to be on my side. Well, that's how I take your side. She will break your heart, and I love you too much to let that happen. He laughed. I love you too, Mia. And don't worry, I've grown out of my crush on Jasmine. Great. What about you? Seeing someone? That's none of your business. She pinched his nose lightly. How's that fair? You interfere with my love affair, and I can't talk about yours. That's because you're my baby wolf cousin. He rolled his eyes. I'm not a baby anymore. And I'm older than you are. Mia glanced around to ensure nobody was nearby. Not in supernatural age. We're both young and inexperienced. Mia, we're both deadliners. The wolfing stuff is out of the picture. You never know. It's in our blood, Lucian. Mia checked to be sure she had all the notes she needed. Let's get out of here. They walked back toward her car. 
Mia glanced around the empty car park. How did you get here? I took the train from the city. Then a taxi here. She grinned. You still backpack around Europe? He chuckled. Kinda. I'm still touring around. Just without the backpack. I've upgraded to suitcases. She backed out of the car park. We'll have lunch at Vines and Soul if you wish, now that I've established you no longer have a crush on Jasmine. Will she cook for me? Well, if you put that grin of yours away, she might. She doesn't cook for the restaurant, though. She manages it. Still, you know her. She's in control down to the sort of cabbage they use in the kitchen. She hasn't changed at all, has she? What about Beatrice? Still loving dogs? Yep. She got pretty serious about it. She has her own vet school now. Wow. Good thing we aren't real werewolves, or it might be confusing for her. Mia laughed. So, what are you doing these days for a living? I still paint. I have an exhibit in Melbourne. That's why I'm here. Mia united her eyebrows. You're not LL by any chance, are you? He grinned. Oh my god. That's you? Yep. The Worlds of LL was my agent's idea. And they made me do all the digital art stuff because it's a trend, so to speak. I don't get to do much of my oil painting anymore. I just want to keep a low profile and do what I love. But I guess this is their bread and butter, so they keep pushing the promotion and marketing. Wow, that's a very big deal, Lucian. Congratulations. He shrugged. I'm still the same. I know. But this is something to be proud of. This is great. He said nothing but looked out the window. What's up? Your dad doesn't approve. His eyes darkened. I don't need his approval. Of course you don't. Look, don't worry about any of that, Lucian. We love you and your art in whatever form it might be. As long as you're happy, you have our support. You can come stay with me or Beatrice, or even at Jasmine's resort when you want quiet time. Okay? So you suddenly don't mind me hanging around Jasmine anymore, he said with a little quirk at the corner of his mouth. She punched him lightly on the shoulder. As long as you behave, Lucian. He nodded his head. I promise. I'll behave. The exhibit isn't going to happen for another week. Can I lay low here for a few days? No press. No PR. No marketing jazz. Seriously, Lucian, if you hate the limelight that much, why do you do it? I don't want to be a starving artist. And once I got on with the commercial world, I realized it's not just me involved. There are others working for a living, and I've got to do the right thing by them. I can't shoot off into the bush and paint what I like, without thinking about whether or not I can sell the stuff. Mia looked at Lucian. You did grow up. He smiled. It's sad, isn't it? She nodded. Okay, here's the plan, you'll stay with me. I have a spare bedroom. Or you can stay at Jasmine's resort if you prefer. I'll stay with you, of course. Good choice. We'll still go to Vines and Soul for lunch, though. As she made a quick turn, her briefcase tipped over on the back seat of the car. The pile of papers she had put in there had made it too bulky to zip it up, so she had she left it open. Now the papers spilled out onto the back seat. Lucian turned to the back. He reached over to stop the papers from falling to the floor. Okay, let me nurse it for you. As he pushed the papers back into the briefcase and brought it to the front passenger seat, Mia noted a white band of skin on his wedding finger suggesting that there used to be a ring there. Sensing her gaze he withdrew his hand and sat straight up in his seat. They said nothing else on the way to the vineyard. Chapter 10 Bertram pulled on his latex gloves as he stood at the front of a small room at the B&B &B where he was told the incident had occurred. Jasmine left him alone to do what he needed to do and went to the reception to call the site manager again. Even though they rarely agreed on anything, Bertram had to admit that his chief, Glenn Williams, had been right all along. When he was assigned to this case, Bertram figured it was for one of two reasons. Glenn knew Bertram hated small towns with a passion, so he could have taken this opportunity to get on his nerves. 
Or perhaps it was a tricky case Glenn wanted to use to break Bertram's seemingly unbeatable case-solving record. When Glenn said this case was so unusual that he wanted Bertram's opinion on it, Bertram didn't believe a word he said. And unusual was an understatement. He took mental notes of his overall first impression of the crime scene before him and then began his work. He had what was referred to by his psychologist as a photographic memory, but Bertram knew he made sense of things by much more than recording pictures in his mind. To him, life consisted of stories. Everyone had a story. Everything happened for a reason. All the cases he had worked on had the same narrative structure. If a single piece of the story didn't fit, it usually happened when someone lied, and he just knew somehow. He didn't have to try to remember things, and he didn't take written notes about cases. If things were within the natural order of the story and things made sense, he would remember every detail. The room in front of him told a perfect story. All he needed to do now was to fill in a couple pieces of the puzzle, and he would be done with this case. The roar of a lawnmower caught his attention. Bertram looked out the window. At the back of the B&B, a man on a small tractor was mowing grass. The window faced the backyard of the B&B. It appeared that this was the last room at the back of the property. Beyond the backyard was the bushland, and to the side was a fence belonging to the property next door. The window would serve as the perfect entry and exit point, should someone wish not to alert the reception or anyone at the front of the house. He frowned at the upper corner of the window frame. Poor workmanship there had left a rough unfinished surface, and if he wasn't mistaken, someone had either gotten a splinter or been scratched by the ragged edge of the wood. He carefully peeled off a splinter of wood where he thought he saw a trace of blood. He bagged and sealed it, and then shoved the bag in his jacket pocket. By the look of the crime scene and how it had been processed, he was pretty sure that this small detail had been overlooked. Bertram exited the room and used a side door at the end of the corridor to go to the backyard. When he got closer, Bertram realized that the gardener was mowing the yard of the property next door. The thin wire fence separating the two properties was nearly invisible from inside the house. Noticing Bertram approaching, the gardener stopped the mower and pulled down his noise-canceling headphones, letting them hang around his neck. Bertram introduced himself. The man looked concerned but gave nothing more than his name. Bob Lucas. Do you do the gardening work for the B&B, &B, too? Bob shook his head. I'm not a gardener. I do odd jobs for the locals. I did some jobs for the B&B &B last month. Some plumbing work and some repairs to their irrigation system and roof. Bertram nodded. Do you do woodwork? Bob frowned. Like firewood supply? No, more like carpentry. Bob chuckled. Oh no, I don't have that kind of eye for detail. Putting joints together would drive me insane. I'm more of an outdoor kind of guy. Bertram nodded. Were you in the area on Friday? Bob smiled. No, I was on a job on the other side of town. But one thing I need to tell you, detective. I share a house with Barb, she goes by Barbara. She manages this B&B. &B. She told me about what happened on Friday. Bertram nodded. It's a small town. This case must have shocked the community. Bob hopped off the ride on lawnmower. I worked in the city before. I've seen lots of junkies and drunks get killed on the street. But yeah, death by bottle is definitely news here. But whatever they say, Jasmine had nothing to do with it. I mean what could she have possibly done? Put poison in the bottle of wine? Bertram frowned. You think the victim drank herself to death? Isn't that what death by bottle means? What exactly did Barbara tell you? She said a woman was killed by a bottle of red wine. Am I missing something? I'm not sure. I haven't seen the body. Do you know Jasmine well? I've done lots of jobs for Vines and Soul. She's always generous with her payments and very understanding with the schedule and all. The B&B &B people aren't so nice. They're not popular in town either, nobody likes them. And they dumped the keys on Jasmine and took off when this happened. Let me tell you, they're the suspects. Bertram nodded. Thank you for your help, but we can only draw conclusions based on evidence. What are people saying about Jasmine and this case? Bob scowled. 
I told you she has nothing to do with it. I understand. I just wondered what sort of gossip the town's spreading about her, and who might have done the talking. Bertram lowered his voice. You seem to be a good and concerned citizen, so I'm asking you to think. Sometimes this sort of informal information and gossip can shed more light on a case than the evidence at the crime scene. Really? Bertram nodded. After glancing toward the front of the B&B, Bob said, Barbara doesn't like Jasmine. So I think she spread a rumor in town that Jasmine wanted to kill her competition. People love gossip, and Barbara feeds them what they want. It doesn't matter how crazy it sounds. I mean, she even told me about the incident, like I could do anything. I know she just wanted me to spread the story to anyone I know. She's desperate to hurt Jasmine. How desperate? Very. She burned down vines. His voice trailed off. You don't think she killed a woman just to make a scene, do you? Oh no, I don't think Barbara's murder material. She can be very petty. She has a big mouth and she can say some pretty bad things. But murder? Nah, I don't think so. Bertram nodded. Thank you. You've been very helpful. He reached his hand out and over the fence for a handshake. You don't think Barbara did this, do you? I don't like her, but I don't want to put her in jail or anything. Don't worry, Bob. Let me take care of the case. Bertram shoved the hand he had just used to shake with Bob into his jacket pocket and took a moment to mentally register this piece of information into the overall arch of the case. Then he headed back into the house. Chapter 11 Jasmine hung up the phone without listening again to the voice message greeting from Barbara's phone. This was just one more reason she thought she had made the right decision not to employ this woman. She didn't even have the courtesy to call Jasmine to tell her she would be late or that she couldn't make the appointment. Standing at the front door of the small B&B, &B, Jasmine glanced back at the bedroom wing and saw that Bertram was still working on his crime scene. He had spent 45 minutes examining the small room, even though there was no longer a dead body there. She didn't know much about the detective, but she knew he was definitely thorough and methodical. He intrigued her. It was tempting to reach out and peek into his emotions right now. But she brushed that thought away and gave herself a third mental slap for the day. It was inappropriate for her to even think about such an action. Jasmine looked out the door and saw Barbara's car pull in and drive up to the entrance of the B&B. &B. Slowly. No need to hurry. You're only forty minutes late, Jasmine muttered to herself. The woman stepped out of the car. It took energy for Jasmine to reach out and connect to others emotionally. She didn't usually do that, especially not with those she didn't care for. But sometimes, when a person's emotions were overwhelming, those emotions poured into Jasmine, and she had no choice but to absorb them. She was startled by the amount of anxiety emanating from Barbara and washing over her. She tried to shrug it off. Barbara hurried toward Jasmine. She looked pale and the bags under her eyes suggested she hadn't slept well the last couple of days. Sorry I'm late. Don't worry about it. The detective is at the scene now. Do you want to set up a table somewhere in reception, so that he can talk with you afterward? Sure, yes I can do that. Barbara hurried toward the waiting area of the reception, and pulled a couple of chairs over to the lounge area. She turned on more lights to brighten the space. Jasmine didn't understand why the B&B &B didn't open up the area with large glass picture windows so that they could capture the view and allow some sunlight in. Instead, the area was closed up and felt even darker because of the thick curtains that hung over the small existing windows. May I? Jasmine gestured toward the heavy-duty barista coffee machine. It needed to be warmed properly before use, and she wanted to get it ready in case Bertram wanted coffee. She glanced at the bag of coffee beans. An acceptable brand. That meant she could safely have her espresso shot. Poor quality coffee beans or those from unknown roasters would mean she would have to have it with milk. Sure. Go for it. You're in charge, Jasmine. I'm not with this business anymore. Despite the voice in her head telling her not to care, she looked at Barbara and said, I guess this isn't an easy time. If you need help, feel free to reach out. Barbara gave her a reluctant smile. There's nothing you can do. 
but thank you for offering. The owners aren't coming back. I'll find a job elsewhere. Jasmine nodded. I'm sorry about that. But with your CV, you won't have a problem getting a job in the city. What's the detective like? Excuse me? He's staying at Vines and Soul, right? What do you make of him? Why do you ask? Well, he's going to interview me, right? I'm a little scared. Wouldn't you be? Being questioned by the police and all. Jasmine shrugged. Only if I had something to hide. Do you? No, of course not. I've got nothing to do with this. I mean, I'm the one who found the body. But apart from that, I hardly knew the woman. If you have nothing to hide, then you shouldn't be worried. Jasmine gave Barbara the most genuine smile she could muster, but her psychic mind was raising alarm bells left, right, and center about the amount of anxiety Barbara was experiencing. If she had nothing to hide, she shouldn't be so nervous. Then again, people worried about all kinds of things. Maybe the prospect of not being able to find another job was worrying Barbara. Jasmine made a mental note not to say anything to Bertram about Barbara's anxiety. She shouldn't talk to him about facts that she couldn't substantiate. Her personal ability to connect to people's emotions didn't exactly qualify as a logical piece of information to be put in a police report. Jasmine. Huh. I was just wondering if you could stay with me when I talk to the detective. Why? I can't provide you with any legal representation. And I'm not even sure you need a lawyer at this stage. Please. I just feel more comfortable having someone with me during the interview. Jasmine sensed the enormous waves of anxiety Barbara was exuding, as if she was going to lose control at any second. She nodded. Okay, if you want me to stay, ask the detective. If he allows it, then I'll stay. Thank you. Jasmine smiled. Tell the detective the truth, Barbara. Everything you know about the case. In my experience, anything other than the truth isn't going to stand indefinitely, and living with secrets sucks. Speaking from first-hand experience? Jasmine shrugged, and at that moment, her phone buzzed with an incoming text. She took the opportunity to ignore Barbara's question. It was a group text from Mia to herself and Beatrice. It read, Lucian is in town. I'm taking him to lunch at Vines and Soul. Can you be there around lunchtime? Lucian. She remembered him as a very handsome young man six years ago. If she could choose one word to describe him, that one word would be trouble. They heard footsteps at the entrance, and Bertram appeared at the door. Sorry to keep you waiting. He stepped in and introduced himself to Barbara. Jasmine went behind the counter to see what was stocked in the bar fridge. Coffee, Bertram? Yes, espresso, please. She smiled to herself. He trusts me. She would never make that decision without knowing who the coffee roaster was. Melbourne City was full of coffee snobs. Maybe Bertram thought she somehow had the magic to make bad coffee taste good. She smiled to herself. What would you like, Barbara? Barbara smiled. Nothing, thanks. Jasmine took the coffee over to Bertram and held on to her own espresso. I'll wait for you outside, she said to Bertram. Oh no, could you please stay, asked Barbara. Can she stay, she asked Bertram. I'm a bit nervous. If Jasmine likes, she can stay. This isn't a formal interview or anything. I just want to get some background information to report to Central. Jasmine sat down. Okay, I'll stay but I'm not sure I'll be of any help. Excellent coffee is a good start, Jasmine. Thank you very much. Then he turned toward Barbara. He hadn't carried any notebooks or recording devices in with him. Maybe this was as informal as he had said. Jasmine leaned back in her chair. Bertram sipped his coffee and asked Barbara background questions regarding her work, the B&B, &B, and her routines on the job. Jasmine kept a neutral face and pretended not to pay attention. None of the questions were directly related to the incident. Barbara answered them easily. Bertram was easing Barbara in, making her feel comfortable, and it worked because Barbara's anxiety level had reduced significantly. Then, when he was about to finish his coffee, he asked the first pertinent question. How did you discover the body? 
Barbara shifted in her chair. The morning was almost over, and Sarah hadn't checked out as she had said she would the night before. I waited a bit, and then I went to her room and knocked on the door. There was no answer, but I could see the door wasn't latched. I called her name and then pushed the door in. That's when it hit the body. She was on the floor and the door hit her head or maybe her shoulder. So you didn't go inside the room? No, I ran and called for help. How can you be sure she was dead? I wasn't sure. But in the report, the owner said you came running back to the main reception saying Sarah was dead. I... I might have said that. So you knew she was dead by looking at her from outside the door? Yes. You didn't think she might have just passed out on the floor? No. I mean I saw her face. Her eyes were open. Dead eyes. I knew when I saw them. Bertram nodded. So she was lying on her side, facing the door, and that was how you saw her face without going into the room. Yes, no. I mean, she was on her back. I must have stuck my head inside the door. But I didn't go into the room. Bertram nodded again. That makes sense. And apart from Bob, who else did you tell about this incident? Excuse me? Barbara shifted again in her chair. Her hands were clasped tightly together on the table. Jasmine didn't need to spy on Barbara's emotions to know she was hiding something. She smiled inwardly, enjoying watching Bertram peeling the information out of Barbara, like layers of an onion. She was glad it wasn't her that he was grilling. You told Bob Lucas about the incident. Who else did you tell? asked Bertram. A couple of people in town. A couple? So too. What are their names? He locked eyes with her, and his tone was gentle but firm. Maybe a handful of people. We get together for gym and afternoon tea, so I just chat. I didn't count how many people there were. The conversation continued, and before Jasmine knew it, her mind wandered to Lucian. Why is he back? Suddenly, a storm of doubt hit her. Jasmine. Bertram called out. Huh. She was pulled back to reality. Barbara had left, so the storm of doubt with a hint of anxiety had come from Bertram, although his face didn't reveal a trace of the emotions he was experiencing. We're going to the morgue now, he said. 